Beautiful. And I talked to my dad like seven, eight years ago. Dad, I want you to leave back something for, for us, your kids and your grandkids and your great, great grandkids. Nobody knew but you and Nobody him. knew. Only I knew. You and him, yeah. And then, and he was so happy to do it. That's what life is all about. You got to be honest, man. You got to know who you want to actually um, really uh, cherish in your life and, and, and work towards that, you know. Everything else is secondary to me. I'm so happy and honored to have you here, Konishki. Glad to have you, man. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> So tell me, tell me, now everyone knows your history. Yeah. In Japan, everyone knows your history, but a yeah. lot of people on my podcast have never seen you because yeah. they're going to be in the U.S. and other places. Oh. So let's start off first of all, because I'm sure a lot of people are going to think that you're from Japan. I know, they stay too. And the funny thing is the people here in Japan still speak uh, English to me. And you know, I'm almost here 40 years already. You've been here 40 years already? Yes, ex uh, exactly in June, 40 years. But you told me that you know, you're, you're having a book that's going to come out. You told me that, and you're going to yeah. talk about your four different cultures that you've had to deal with. Exactly. Well, to well, this year, um, 22 is a great uh, year for me. Um, even after through this pandemic, it's been a struggle for everybody I know. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I've, uh, I'm glad that uh, it's kind of slowing down because I get to celebrate 40 years in Japan. And one of those celebrations, actually, uh, by the time this interview gets out, I just dropped my my 40th anniversary CD, which is with my wife. It's all Japanese music. Singing, oh, singing. Oh, singing. Music. People already know I have a singing career starting in 2000. In fact, right after I retired, I went to the U.S. I got on MTV and international. I went to, I was, um, had an album called uh, Konishiki, Master of Sumo. Let's get to this. First of all, where were you born? 63, 1963, okay, December where? 31st in Hawaii. In Hawaii? Born and raised in Hawaii. Okay, but you told me you're of two cultures, not just Hawaiian. Because I was born in Hawaii, but I'm Samoan. That's right. I'm 100% Samoan. Your mother and father are both Samoan. Yes, them, they're exactly. both from American Samoa. How, how many siblings? We have a big family, like every other Polynesian. We've got 10 kids. And what number are you? I'm the bottom number two. <laughs> Second from the bottom? Yeah. Look at you. Are all your, all your um, family doing okay? Well, I just lost my dad two years ago, mm. and mom passed away like 80, 90 years ago. And a few of my siblings already passed, there's like me, um, my brother who's two years older than me, and then I have a sister, two sisters, one more brother left. So there's five of us. Growing five, up, six, we're good. were you big growing up? Were you a big kid? Not really. I started noticing myself getting big when um, I got into junior high school. I started lifting weights uh, junior okay. high school and All stuff, right. so... That's where the body started getting me. What sports, what sports were you in? I was in mostly in football. In football? I played a lot of football. What position? I played nose tackle and offensive tackle. <laughs> and then uh, I was a power lifter off season. A power lifter off yeah, season? Yeah, I, 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 was, I was a crazy natural From junior strength. high school? From junior high school. Okay, so you did this all the way through high school? Up to I went up to, yeah, I went to high school all the way. Played football. But then football. after that, then you didn't go to college? No, I came straight to Japan. Why did you come? Who brought you to Japan? What made you Nobody to actually brought me to Japan. It was something that happened towards the end of my career, uh, high school career. I was actually um, deciding if I was going to go to college. Funny thing, I had some colleges that I wanted to go to school to actually study pre-law. I wanted to be in like an FBI or CIA. You, didn't, you did really well academically in school? Pretty much pretty good because the school I stayed in, if you didn't stay above average, they would kick you out. It's a semi-private school I went to. It's a very small school. Right. My graduating class was only like uh, 56. Okay. So the school was great academ uh, um, academically. Academically, it was a uh -huh. great school. Uh -huh. And the sports, even though you played sports, you had to like keep a certain grade. Right, or you get kicked out. Yeah. So um, when they came... When it came towards the end, because I'm coming from a big family, financially, I, see the, I saw the struggle growing up with my parents. Okay. And my parents being Samoan, my mom never spoke any English. My dad spoke broken English, because they're from Samoa. Wait, wait, so you speak, of course, you have, if she never spoke any English, that means you speak for Samoan. Samoan, yeah. yeah. So our first language is Samoan, because of mom and dad. So the house, we weren't allowed to speak English, because my parents couldn't speak English. With, with those languages, first of all, Samoan, that's not similar to any other language, is it? It's uh, familiar, but it's completely different from Tongan, Samoan, um, uh, Tokedawan is another language you, you, the people know, but it's very different. And Tongan itself is, you know, uh, Hawaiian is different. 
Right, right. And even Maori is different. Yes. So there's all different uh, languages in the Polynesian culture. Mm -hmm. So someone has their own language and something that we had to understand and know because of uh, my parents. So I was born and raised in Hawaii, me and my brother and my younger sister. But we actually was uh, raised in a Samoan culture. So in the home household, the way we live our life, the way we cook, the way we lived our life was like a Samoan system. And that's all you heard was just Samoan too yes. at home. Yes, yeah. So, you mean, so, you, so that's two cultures right away, American and then and Samoan. Samoan. yes. So outside of your home, you were American. Yes, you had to. So you grew up with two cultures. And, that, and that's what I meant when I talked to you over the phone. Right. That's what I meant about it because right. going back to what we're going to go to the book is actually the the four cultures they were talking about, the first two ones was American culture and a Samoan boy living mm -hmm. in a Samoan uh, American culture. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to Japan, I didn't. I thought I was coming to Japan, but I wasn't coming. I came to Sumo, which is a th completely different other culture. He has his own ways, his culture are different. And then Japan itself is a different culture. Japan don't really know what Sumo is all about. Right. No one does unless you're su in Sumo. Exactly. So, and, <laughs> uh, but you speak this... There's, there's different language, dialects, the way we live our life is different, the way we dress is different. Well, let's get into that for a second. Mm. So you came to Japan knowing that you wanted to be in the sumo. Exactly. And um, I found out that I wanted to go to sumo because um, when I first uh, got found on the beach in Waikiki, a guy who actually was uh, very famous in the Russian world here in Japan used to go against one of the biggest names of wrestling in Japan, Riki Dozan. Niki Dozan actually wrestled this guy named Curtis the Buyaoke, the king, they call him. He was originally from Hawaii. So that 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 man always at the beach uh, renting out the boogie boards and mats and stuff. So he used to sit on the wall. We call it the wall down in Waikiki. If you go to work, there's a big wall that goes out into the ocean. And they used to go in and he, and he husky voice. He was like, hey, you young man, come here. And then he was like, yeah, call me over because um, he used to watch sumo. In Japan, when he came for his tours, and you're 17 at this time. I was 17, okay. you know, almost 18 at the time. And then he goes, "You should be a sumo wrestler." And then, are you number 79 at the Wolf Pack team? That's Pack Five. Yeah, yeah, Uncle, I'm number 79. You, you, the number one plays uh, offensive tackle. You play nose guard. Yeah, Uncle, I'm that. Thing. You should be sumo wrestler. And he, I'm looking at him like, "What the hell is sumo?" You I never, know, right, I okay. never know what sumo right, was. Of course, right. uh, and I didn't really know anything about Japan. And then. He kept on carrying the conversations because I was actually cutting out of class. I was at the beach. We were surfing with the boy. We went out to surf, and I couldn't surf not even once when we went because he always put me on the side <laughs> and told me about sumo. You should be a sumo. You should How be a sumo. How many times was this? Did he do this? The whole week. <laughs> <laughs> was like almost towards the last two, three weeks of uh, uh, school. So, you know how <laughs> yeah, yeah. high school is, it just right. tests and it's right, right. Like, so, so me and my friend just said, frick it, bro. We just went, I just went out of my doorstep and act like I went to school, school but right, I didn't, right. bro. Went all, parents would be once I got to school, I ate breakfast. We got in the car and went down because the waves were up. <laughs> but I never got the chance to get in the water because of that. Everybody else was in the water, but the old man would push, pull me on the and side. You, but you found it interesting, obviously. Well, you know, in, in Hawaii, they respect when somebody all the talks to you, you have to stop. Ah. It's, it's it's a cultural thing. Got you. I got you. And, uh, so okay. I couldn't just walk away and say, nah, you know, we can't you get a dog that. It's it's in, in, <laughs> in, in Hawaii culture, it's bachi. Somebody's going to hit you. Right. you know, in, in, in. <laughs> right. So I kept on listening to him. And then the thing that made me um, really look at it is when he said, uh, we can meet. Jesse Takamiyama, which I didn't know who he was, too. You didn't know who Jesse was? No, no, right? I have right, no idea. You didn't know anything about sumo, of course. And then he said, well, he, he explained to me, and then yeah, you, you, you can have a career in sumo. And then, you know, I just out of, I just, out of my brain, I just, oh, well, what, what the hell? I got nothing to lose. I'm just going to go meet this guy. You know, at Kapiolani, I still remember Kapiolani um, Hotel by Waikiki, and then it was a pool site. And it was like free food, you know, 18 year old, never been in a hotel. So like, wow, the free food, poolside. <laughs> I just go take it. And so I went. And then that's when he, I met him and then he kept speaking about... Takamiyama, you met? Yeah, Takamiyama for the first time. He came after a tournament. And he said, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then he told me, well, you know, I'm, I'm like you. I came from Maui with nothing. I came here when I was 19. And this is what I have now. And then it's really up to you. Sumo is... is and he was really honest. Sumo is not easy. And, you, and there's nothing I, about sumo that's worse than nice. It, you know, it, you got to sacrifice everything. If somebody passes in your family, there's no way you can go home. There's no such thing as you going home during a tournament Simply before tournament. Yeah. And uh, you just got to suck it up and stuff. So he explained to me that the hard part of it 
He's just being away from home because we're foreigners. And then he told me, and the good thing about the whole thing is there's no burden on your family. You won't be, they won't, they won't have to worry about paying rent or worrying yeah. about what you eat or where you right. stay. And that's what, and that's what, that's what sold me. That was the attractive yeah. part. The that's attractive. the most attractive because I, I saw my family struggle. Even I'm the only guy that never went to college in our family. Right. Everybody you, went. You made more money than anybody yeah. in your family. Yeah, but the thing is, the thing is, they all went to college right. on scholarships. But the thing was, in those days, I don't know, around our time, scholarship wasn't paying everything. They only paid for the books. That's true. That's and they true. went they boarding, pay, full ride. like boarding, like now they pay for everything. Right. Right. Like boarding. Now and then, they do, yeah. And being living in Hawaii, when it became like spring break, my parents couldn't afford to bring my brothers home. Gotcha. So they had to go stay in California or Seattle with relatives. And I saw that, I go, I ain't going to do it. And then when he said, everything is free, they're going to fly you up there, you get leaves in. And then I said, that's it, I'm gone. And he, and I made a decision. I went out and got my visa, got a passport for the first time. And then I I told my parents a week before I came that I was coming. They had no clue. They had no clue. They had, what they well, feel about well, that? Because growing up as a kid, my mom and my dad saw me differently. They saw me as actually being a preacher. You believe it or not. Because I went to this uh, Bible school. Uh, during the summer, during the summer, they, we all go because we went to the Samoan church that they had a program during the summer for kids who were staying in school. We had so these Bible study classes we had during the summer, and then you take the test right before you go back to school, and then they, they give you the scores on Christmas Day. Okay. So seven years I went to that, and I took first place for six years. I only took second one year. Doing what? Bible, Bible studies, prayers, prayers and, and, and then memory, memory. And you had a contest. They, yeah, you have you, a contest, somebody, and you take be a, a panel. They ask you questions. A question that you have a, you got to preach, you got to pray, you got to, and then you have a writing test. And you wanted six out. of I seven I was six years. out of se seven, and my my parents thought I was going to be a preacher. And then when when he came, when I told him that I'm going to Japan, my dad cried, and I thought he was going to be this. Like, and then I told him, Dad, the only reason I went because I was so afraid of you guys beating me up not going to church. Because <laughs> my dad was very strict. You know, yeah. church time was eight o religious, yeah. 9 o'clock, bro, you're in the you church. Gotta you got to. And, you know, growing up as we got older, football was the thing. And we used to be like NFL Sunday, Sunday morning. Like we like just sitting at there waiting on the TV, trying to fight every minute we can until <laughs> church. Oh, shit, it's 9 o'clock. <laughs> and we got to sprint because once we hit the third bell, once the third bell rings, the door closes. And, and we you're got you're not in there. You're, oh, you're, you're not be, in there, bro. The whole day would be hell. My, yeah. my, me and my brother would actually be the ones in church crying because my dad, we went the thing, boom, and because dad sits in the back and we sit in the front because we're in the choir. Can see, right. He can see us walking. He, my dad would like, boom, boom, boom. boom. Like, we'd like <laughs> crying during the sermon, like, thank you, Lord. Like, no, <laughs> it's not no Lord. It's like just crying because we, and that, <laughs> and that was what I, that's why he, I did everything I can to to make you guys happy, you know. I made sure I, I went through those studies in the morning, to summer and stuff. And so then, what he so what he say about that? Did, 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 he was he was he was they were shocked. Not really mad, but kind of shocked. shocked. He cried. I remember, mom just mom was mom like every mom. My mom was the bad mouth this way, <laughs> just like what? screaming and then grabbing my shirt, and she was crying. And she she just, didn't want to let you go. She never because she she told me me and my sister would never go leave the island if you wanted to go to school, go nearby because I want you guys because you know, everybody left keep, us. Yeah. Right, she needed to keep some of her family there. And then and she found out my mom never talked to me for the whole week. And you know my mom never said a word since I wait no that past. No, she she was so shocked. Wait 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 wait. You mean from the as long as you were here, she said nothing. She finally said something. No, no, no. The, from the from the day I told her, yes. it was a week before I left. Right. She never said one thing to me. <laughs> she she, wouldn't she was in a all. shock, and and even the only word she said to me from that week on is when at the airport when she grabbed my machine and said, "Don't go." One more time. Yeah, at the end, and and that's the only time I see her picture. I'm, while I'm talking to her, I, I see her face in my head because she grabbed on me and she put on me. One and, more time, uh, please. Right, right by the entrance, the gate. Those days in Hawaii, you could go up to the gate right, right, and right, say right, goodbye. Goodness. Everybody could go to the gate, and she just was crying. And I act like an 18 year old kid. Of course. Like, hey, mom, don't worry, mom. Don't like, I try to pep her up while I'm right. saying, but inside I'm burning because I don't know what the hell I'm so doing. I don't know <laughs> where I'm going. going. You're right. And so, you know, and when I left, I just, and I, and I just left. And mom, this was her first and last word the week before I left is don't go. Don't go. And then, you know, f the funny thing is they saw me with no luggage. I came with a shoulder bag with my Bible, my album. 
I had a slacks in there, shoes, and a lower shirt I thought I was going to wear when I get out to Japan, but I didn't. My mom made me a pareo, which is a Samoan tradition wear with pockets okay. in our tradition. Right. She made it, and she, she in that morning when I was going to the airport, she went to a Samoan store down in a place called Waipau. She went in and bought a shirt. If you look at my first picture, there's a shirt I'm wearing with a blueprint that says Samoa on it. So right. she had so much pride of being a Samoan. Samoan right. So that's what I wore when I came. I was wearing slippers and got to Narita in that, in that fashion. I had no money. I came with no, not even a penny to my name when I came to But Japan. they came, they picked you up, and then what was Nobody the... picked me up, and that's a funny thing. I had to wait, figure wait, out wait, what wait, went wait, 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 I had to figure out myself because there were some Japanese guys, um, local guys on a plane that helped me out because I didn't have money even for pay to pay. Uh, those days, remember, they had the taxes. You yeah, had to pay the right, right, coupon. Right. Right. I didn't have money for that, so somebody paid for me. So when I got out, nobody came to pick me up from Narita. We had to catch the bus, so somebody else paid for me to get on a bus to come to... So and then I met him at uh, Hakozaki, Hakozaki, Hakozaki right? bus station. Yes. And that was my first vision of, like, Jesse and guys came. Jesse was there, so he was there Jesse waiting was for you. At Hakozaki. Right. I'm what? the only guy that have no picture at Narita. You had nothing. Nothing. So I had no luggage, too, so I, I walked out because I had no shoulder bag. That's so, all I had. So what was your first experience like? Where did you sleep that night? What was uh, it like? The first night I came in, I met with the boss. There's a big... Um, press conference, there's this kid from Hawaii, which was me, and I think I slept at Grand Palace Hotel, not this, that old one by uh, Idabashi, oh, yeah. right, right, right. Um, with Jesse, and then the next morning, I already was on a train going to Nagoya. I debuted a few days after that already, mm -hmm. in Nagoya, 1982. Okay. So, and that's when my career started. How, start, but when, so when you went to Nagoya, what did you do? You I went there? to the sumo stable, I, I, I joined the sumo stable, officially. All right, all right. But then and then you, you become you become a swimmers and you became you became, you became the the pot scrubber, the, the cleaner. I'm saying, you, yeah. didn't, you didn't start doing sumo yet. You no, know? no, you do sumo. Well, that, but so you actually do sumo and do everything else that comes with it. The cleaning, the working, all that stuff comes with it. Not just practice? No. You're actually in a tournament? Yes. So how did you wait? How did you feel then? How was that? That had to be throwing you off because everything not like, about not playing football. Well, everything about the whole thing was crazy. I, I so was like, you, man, so we're actually sleeping in a temple. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know where to grab. How, somebody had to tell you something. Well, well, you you learn it while you're in there, uh, <laughs> unexperienced. Oh, what? what? Yeah, you just learn it. This you so go through the you basics. How did you do? They beat the hell I, out of you. Oh no! I came in pretty strong. You remember, I was a powerlifter and played football. Okay, right, for somebody right, right. my size, okay. my size play. alone and my strength alone got me over the first. Right, right, right. And um, my first tournament, they give you three matches. All right. Then I went through my three matches. I won all three matches. In fact, I went un what? I went what undefeated. I went undefeated for three tournaments um, without without losing. But how were you? What were you doing? I was all hitting. My my hand. I was, that's what you did. My style was all. Open hand hitting was Taking all about. Yeah. yeah, because the, the thing yeah. is, my boss taught me uh, not to go to the belt because, again, the kids who are doing sumo are much more experienced. You know, no they do. they uh, chibiku sumo they call it like little league sumo. Mm -hmm. They've been doing like then three years old. So naturally, when they grab, they know how to twist and throw. Right. And he said, <clears throat> it's, "It's it's no way you're gonna win anyway." And it was and he was right because they leverage, you know, their body. The body movement and the way they use their body, they knew how to use their body by throwing. Right. It's like the judo techniques. Right, right, it's right, not, right. they're taking advantage of my weight to, to kick my butt, right, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. So he actually taught me that it's, it's a hard technique where you just got to hit, get them out, out of there, get them away with, with, with and your hands. You and that was my style, you know. And then I kind of mastered that because of my strength. It worked good for me because of my power and my strength. And for... At the time, for my for my body weight, I was actually quick off the ball, so it really helped me. And until this day, I still hold a record for the fastest ever to stuff on the bottom to get to the top rank judo, which is a high rank. What was it? it was eight tournaments. Time? Eight tournaments. Eight tournaments. So, which is less than a year and a half. Takes a regular guy average five years. And you did it in? Less than a year and a half. In, less, in two years and one tournament, I became the fastest to become Sekiwake, mm -hmm. junior champion. Mm -hmm. And I almost won the Emperor's Cup at the last Kuramai Kokikan, which is, was in uh, Kuramai, right. before they moved back to Ryogoku right, right. in 1984. Mm -hmm. So I was just flying up the ranks, you know. So tell me, now let's get into this. Sumo, 
culture, mm. Japanese culture. Well, sumo Two culture, different things. That had to shock you too. Well, it's sumo itself, I knew more about sumo culture than anything else. And the language we spoke in, 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 in sumo had a different dialect in, in regular Japanese. Also, you're learning the pro who Who's yeah. teaching you? Who's teaching you? You learn while you go on. No one teaches you. You just got to learn. And well, somebody hit you, you say, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, everything is just learned on, on site. How long, did it take? <laughs> How long did it take you? For language? Yes. Language, well, it took a while. Maybe my first year, I could listen. Yeah. I could get around. But um, in sumo, you're not allowed to talk anyway. The only thing you're allowed to say is, hi. See my saying? Hi, see my Yeah, because people got to understand, senpai kohai, which is a seniority thing in Japan, mm -hmm. where you do all the dirty work. And whatever the senpai tells you, and that's that's it. What's you got some of the worst stuff you did that you really still remember today? Oh, those saying? guys used to bully me. How? Whew, bully, like get whacked in the head with a beer bottle and get pissed on, get kicked on. But you know that's and stuff. You can't, and you can't retaliate. Yeah, I can't retaliate. But you know, and that's and that's some of the things I want to talk about because thank God they did that to me because that's all, all I needed for motivation. You know, Thank take you. it to the ring, and and the one thing I it, it, it helped me. It's I don't want to really the way I'm saying. I said it one time during news media, and they like took it the wrong way. Okay, I just said when I went, if I can kill a guy in the ring legally, then I've did it legally, and that's what motivated me because every gotcha. day you thought about it. You thought every about day the guys were treating me like shit. I would like come in like, okay. oh, can you say shit? Right. <laughs> right. Got in the ring. Yeah, I, I my head was telling me, bro. That's what you did to me. I remember, and then I used to like just speak, because my good senpais would, you know, my senior guys who were good to me would teach me to, don't even try to say anything. Just stay in and just fight it. Because when I joined sumo, I used to, everything is by by when you join seniority. So when I joined, I actually slept right by the door where all the garbage was, like all the rubbish was here, and you know, smells and guys who come home drunk, drunk, or puking in there, and like, I'm like sleeping right back to the garbage, kind of like in here, and like guys kicking you because I'm sleeping right at the doorway in those days with the futon. So I just would like peek up and look, oh, okay, brother. Wait, but did you ever get sick or anything? I mean, nah. I had to go never got sick once. <laughs> I got hurt, I got broken fingers and broken knees and braced ankles and. But not from the abuse. From the abuse or just from sumo? no 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 no, I was tough, bro. My, my the abuse there is nothing compared to what my dad would do to us. <laughs> That's why you got the trick all the time. Yeah, the dad saw I, you. you. I was compared you to you were afraid of dad. That's what I, he I'm more afraid than my father than anything. I'm not afraid of anything, anything, anything in the world but my dad. dad. Right. That's the way I was. Yeah. And and it, <laughs> and that helped me because right. what they were doing to me is nothing. I got hit with the five four, two by four. I got whipped by a freaking. Water holes, and you know, I, 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 you I got. Know what pain is, yeah. yeah, I know what real pain is, man. Right, this right, is right. nothing, man. <laughs> I still remember when I was fifteen. I used to play instruments for the church. Like what? I, what instruments? You choir. Play? I played the saxophone at that time, but I played other instruments too. But I played saxophone for the choir a certain Sunday, and I went to the beach and I was body surfing one day. When and you were supposed to be at church. I was supposed to be at the choir practice on okay. Saturday for okay. Sunday, and I, I, and I, I look at and I look. I don't have no watch. It's all by feeling. Oh, okay, it's about time. But I came home late. The ready choir started. My dad was standing on the fence at the edge because they had choir practice at our house in our garage. And I go, oh my God, I'm going to get killed. And like, my body's all wet and salty. And, and I look at that, man, this it, man. And like looking down, I get nothing to, nowhere to go. I just walked in. My dad whipped me up so bad with the water hose. I couldn't sleep for three days. I had to sit like this. My body was all ripped up with the water hose in the front of the choir. He did that. If that was here today, you, Cooper, my dad would have gone to jail. Been, he would have been. Yeah, sure. Never get out again. You, you know what? Do, do respect. I love my dad so much. Right. And I'm glad he did that because, you know. It prepared and, you for this. Yeah, it, it prepared me for, for life, what for I do life, today. Right. Like, time is people's people's respect and disrespect you know if people and japan actually is something like that which is Isn't sumo is even more sumo when you tell you come early you, you, like we had we we're told like when when we get gathers and the, and the boss is going to be there if it's five o'clock we're there like five fifteen uh four fifteen we're really? outside waiting yes and it's a good teaching you know so it's that i always remind me when my dad did that because he he was strict on time when he told us we wanted the best thing he could do to us let us go to the beach. And then we would love, because it's only walking distance, right. but my, we had to ask every time you leave the lot, 
you have to ask for permission. Even mm -hmm. if dad is not home, you got to ask mom. Mm -hmm. Make sure. Even as old as we got, everything was permission. Was he strict with your sisters? Too? Oh, all of them. But so mom was equal. even tougher. Oh, yeah, very equal. But she'd be harder on the girls. Mom, mom was like mean, man. She to was, the girls, to the girls. Yeah, even dad, too, when dad had her. Dad was all level, man, all normal. Every Everybody got the ev same. Yeah, everybody got the same. But your mother was Mom harder. was the worst, but... She would beat us up like... Wait, wait, you, your mom would whip you too? Oh, yeah. My mom used to beat us up so bad. Me and my brother used to like, um, growing up, third, fourth grade, as we got bigger, my mom, we had to, we, we had to play it, play, we had to fake it like we were in pain. Cause, because cause, cause, did. Yeah, because, because mom would stop when she saw us like crying and stuff. So we kind of yeah. figured it out. Or when she hits and then she got to a point we faked it and she stopped and then... We got so big that her broom started to break, break, on, break, break, break on us. And she so, wouldn't care. She and then she went again. But the thing is, she noticed that we was, she wasn't strong enough for, for hit us and put us in any kind of pain. Yeah. So the scary thing mom can say, you wait until dad comes home. <laughs> so then you didn't know, please, okay, yeah, mom, yeah. Please, like please, when yeah. she said that, like we He's knew okay. like, we knew exactly what time dad drives in the way. <laughs> when dad drove in, was right there waiting for him. You know, and I'm glad I was brought up that way because that's you know, love. They loved you. It is, that's it is love, love. You know, for that's for for for, for a family that actually came from Samoa, migrated and had nothing, don't even speak English. You know, I, the stuff I went through to be where I am today is nothing compared to what my dad did. Of course, because yes. you you that's know true. talk about that you can see that. That's right. Talk about information. We have so much information that you can get too. A family that had to save so much, his, yeah, his, okay. his parents had to put all their money together to send him because they saw the opportunities that they think my dad, as his son, would have for his family. Better hospitals, better doctors for his family to grow. And they worked so hard to get him there. But now he goes there and he has nowhere to go. He was actually staying in people's garages and he, until he got settled. What about, what about, where did he meet he, your mother? Well, mom, well, mom, they met already in Samoa, oh, but okay. she left, so, he oh, left she, them behind because yeah, so all he my, got set up something first. All my other brothers and sisters were already born. They was in Samoa. Right, so right, just right. to think about the stuff he went through or think to any of our parents those That's days true. That's true. compared to what we have today. We, we, we're crybabies compared to what they're going through. <laughs> you know, like they, really, my dad you just, you don't have children. Uh, do you? No. Okay. We just, my dad just passed two years ago. He, he never said anything about pain. And I knew something went wrong with him. And then he goes, nah, I'm not good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Even the, till the day he died, he actually, I don't want to swallow something wrong with that. Good dad, you got to go. You got to go to the hospital. He said, oh, no need, no need. No, you're going now because you're going to go to Japan. He wanted to go to Japan with me. I thought, you got to go and check up so I know what kind of medication you need. He, he got, he got, he lies so much. He don't even take the medication. He goes and he doesn't use it. And he, you know, he lived to like 86. But it's funny when he made it to 86. Yeah. That's so it's funny because he hates hospital. He doesn't go. And he's, he's very uh, strong religiously. And his spirit is so good. And he doesn't show any, any weakness. As a father, so I grew up watching a strong dad, right. and I couldn't see him sick at all. But I could notice him because his last couple of years, when I went to Hawaii, I spent at least two months out of the year. I will make sure from December to February, I would spend the whole almost two months with him, and then I go back in June and spend the whole day because of Father's Day and right. and uh, and then his birthday. Yeah. So we slept in the same room, me, my wife, and my dad. Every time I set up the bed where he slept with us, and and we, because he prayed every morning. He, my dad would pray like six, six, seven times a day. And then you know when he passed, and he passed a strong man. He never suffered it, but I don't want to force him to go to the hospital. And then they found that he had water in his lungs. And the doctor said your dad actually had two mild heart attacks yesterday. At home. At home, but nobody knew. So it's funny. That's I listen to it. I'm like freaking out. Yeah, that's one of those Mohegans, man. Those freaking old school guys. They don't. They don't talk. They don't talk pain. They just fight through it. You, you were know? by his side when he passed. Huh? Were yeah. You by his side. You no. Know, yeah. Well, he passed. And the funny thing, I think, what I'm trying to get to is where he went to the hospital, and then he took some tests, and they found out all that stuff. So he stayed overnight. We prayed before he left. Okay, Dad. See you tomorrow. And then he had his breakfast in the morning. And then my my niece and my sister told me, yeah, they bought a wheelchair to him. And he hates when people try to cater to him. So he never used wheelchair. And he said, no, I can't walk. But he, he could walk. So he then took a walk. He said, you know, good to move your body around because they went to tests on you. And then he walked He walked around. He fell and he was gone. That's when he died. Okay. And i like, oh, man, he saw my daddy. Man. you know, a and, strong man. You know, and then, um, you know, we... I was lucky because right, 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 right before the pandemic. 
we yes. had a great celebration. That's he's beautiful. His 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 uh, ceremony. I I told my family, hey, we ain't we ain't we ain't Wayne Black at his funeral. Every you know his red collar is, and nobody's actually tearing. Is we're gonna celebrate? And I made my nieces and nephews and my brother. I was the youngest, but I told no 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 no. It's a celebration, and we're not doing traditional style. We're gonna do the way my dad would like. Sing and dance in these in these, so his daily sermon was so fun. It was happy, like all my uncles like freaking out. And the thing that I surprised everybody with, I told them we have a special preacher coming to the. I actually filmed my dad seven eight years ago actually preaching at his own funeral, oh. and prayers, and that and and I talked to my dad like seven eight years ago. Dad, I want you to leave back something for for us, your kids and your grandkids and your great great grandkids. Nobody knew but you. And Nobody him. knew. Only I knew. You and him, yeah. And then, and he was so happy to do it, and he was like so talkative, he was so happy that he could leave information. Not only that, I got all the back history of how he met mom, where his background comes from, where his where he does his ancestors come that from. They his. never knew. Nobody knew. Maybe well, we know. know. We don't know too because we're right, born and raised in Hawaii. Yeah. And his relatives that came, his brothers, his uncles, his his, his nephews, his, they like everybody just freaked out because I told. The night before, one of my co first cousins, he was a preacher. I told him, "Cuz, I'm going to share something with you at my house. Watch this video." And then he looks and goes, "Wow, what is this? I did this eight years ago because I knew someday we we're going to say goodbye to my dad, and I wanted him to preach at his his funeral and stuff like that." And he did the prayer. He did a, a Bible um, script, and then he, he prayed and stuff. And then I told him at the end of the ceremony, how our guests will be coming. Everybody turn around and face the back. So the whole church taped up for the family. Everybody look at the back, and 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 I had a big screen, and then boom, oh, he man, comes out man, like everybody's like blew their mind. Now, that is yeah, beautiful. and it was so beautiful, and like even today, I talk, I feel so warm because you know, you and this is something that uh, everybody can learn from because do it now while they're alive. And the thing is, the warmth I got from that, every time I feel like down, this pandemic has been hard, but I always think of him and he pushes me. I feel his, I feel his spirits in me. So I go back and look at the church ceremony and everyone's like singing and happy and his warmth. I can feel him more than I feel the ceremony because that's his, that's his soul, him. So I go back and look at that just for, uh, you know, just for encouragement, just encouragement and, and yeah, to go in pushing over all this. Everybody's going through the struggle, so it's, it's nothing right, different, right. yeah. Isn't that something? So it's it's crazy how going back to the sumo thing is because my dad was much tougher than the whatever any, dad. any other stuff went through. So the prep yeah. that he prepped me about, and that's why I was talking about the four cultures, the Japanese. Thing, I was trying to find similar similar things that I learned from the four cultures that helped build this konishiki we sit mm. to, sitting there today. Right. So the thing is, I asked myself the question, how the hell can an 18-year-old kid know nothing about Japan and just come in with it's nothing and time. just come and do sumo? So I'm trying to research how my mind works. So what everybody knows what, what I've done. You go to Wikipedia, you see all the records, but what they don't see is all those li little things that I did in my career, what happens behind, what the mindset tells you, what your body tells you, it's two different things. Sometimes your body is there, but your mind not there. Sometimes your body is there, but your, pa your body is in pain. So how do you find ways to get overcome? Every, every, ch every challenge with every tournament is all kind of different. And I found how to grow with stuff like that to help me what I go through today. I'm never afraid, I never, I'm nev never afraid of failure anymore because... I failed and came back because of that strong um, ways I found to get over things during the career, which helped me to do what I, I do today. So it's great for coaches that I've learned. I'm glad that I learned because it all, it all added to who I am today. And that's what this book that I'm working on should come out in October. And the good thing about it is I didn't want to do it myself because there's things I can explain in English. I just think I want to say in Japanese because it makes me easier to say it, to explain in Japanese in my book. So I had to find a person who can uh, actually be trans and have not only knows perfectly English and Japanese, but have some kind of sense of sumo world right. and American and, American mm -hmm. and Japan culture. Mm -hmm. And then some sense of Samoa. But that's the only thing, it's a funny thing, I found somebody that they hired me to sing at their wedding okay. and found out the guy is a director 
the wife is like a writer and she's like she knows everything about sumo what? and then the director who does like movies and stuff like that he's he, they're both actually Japanese Japanese Americans but they were born in Japan and lives in New York and they're the perfect people to write the book with me sense, yeah. wow I was so and I was so happy because it's funny because they hired me to do and they found out what they're doing and then once the pandemic happened my dad's film was done I called them up you know what I want to I want to I want you guys to write my book help me write my book they went because when I safe. listen to you you know so much damn thing about sumo <laughs> the wife knows that much and then you guys perfect English there's stuff I can explain in English that real good and that. then stuff I couldn't ex I can explain better in Japanese because of the language barrier in my head the see the way I was you know taught in sumo and stuff right. so it's it's exciting because I want people to learn it, it's it's about learning how to accept the moments that we have right and um, learning how to put yourself in, in environments where you're not, you're not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the only thing I can say is um, accept it until you, 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 you know how to work with it. Right. You know, every time you fight it, you, you, you tend to lose because there's no way you're going to win the battle with something that's been there way before you came, right? <laughs> that's for sure. And that's the way I looked at sumo. I came in and just shot up and did my work. My dad's famous line is, I just shut up and work. <laughs> Which is true. You shut up and work and just do your job. And you know, everything else comes in, falls in place after the work ends, you know. Listen, I think that you summed up your, your podcast for this time with yeah. your dad. I love it. Oh, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something great. I, uh, and your connection with your father, that's something, because I was raised by my father mm. as well. And that's something that's just that bond. Yeah, so, it's so, so warm. Much. Just us oh, talking about it. Because so the warm. times, what did he, just listen with this last part. Now you told me about how he whipped you, but what did you know that he did outside of that that he loved you? Man, you everything. Me? Dad was always there for the family, and because of um, this is the first dad I know went to work, came back, never, never took any hobbies outside of home. He did washing, he did cleaning, everything. He, he, example of a, a man taking care of his family. His family was his hobby. And my dad was so funny. He never ate at work. He, this is one man I never saw him take a lunch at. He never ate, he ate one meal a day. Ever since I know him as watching him go to work, never prepped lunch for him. He never used even, he never used a coin even to buy soda from a machine. He drinks out water pipes. And like, I look at that, I'm like, man, how can he, you know, she's, and then he used to like have change in his ashtray, in his car. And you know, he used to go and put gasoline. He never spends money on himself at all. I never saw my dad buy a soda, buy a hamburger, or anything. Never. It's either he buying it for somebody or buy it for everybody. He never buy anything. So I like it. And then he used to have all these chains in it. And he used to like pack it, save it. Any time, dime you see on the floor, he pick it up. Put, and then like once every month, he would like take all that out and give it to me and my brother because we was just traveling from from where we were going to school was actually in downtown where we lived in the country. And he would like pull it all out. You guys go eat breakfast because, you know, at, at that driving or something so, and then catch your boss to go and my dad was always like there for the whole family you know and he was so well respected because he was a leader and then a leader even is like one of the nicest person to his wife my mom was like she she's like <laughs> screaming she's f that f that and my dad was like oh all right, all right. You, never, never, I, you never heard him argue something? no my dad never he just takes it he just sits there mm. and then <laughs> his his favorite line to mom was See, that's how come you seek and I not seek because you treat me like that. <laughs> so it's so funny. And he just jokes about it. And, and, and that's how strong a man should be. That's right. You know, and I saw that and I, I talk about that all the time. It's funny. His funeral was so funny because we all had to go up and talk about him, right? Okay, right? The most thing that people talk about, my sister, my older sister used the one used to drive with him go to work because she graduated, she was working. So they work on the same way. And every morning, she was, when she went up to talk about dad, she goes, you know, every day I used that, I was asked that, Dad, you okay? Mom was yelling at you in this and, and, and Dad would tell her, Yeah, what you guys worried about? I'm a strong man. Mom is a weak lady. She, 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 you know, she's sick and, and that's what, that's what I have to do. And like, she was like laughing. Everybody laughed because we all knew that. Mom was like queen. If mom wasn't happy, oh, hell would break, break loose. loose. <laughs> and the funny thing is, when she, it's the kids that made her pissed off. And she would only turn to my dad. My dad would have to cook, do everything for her. And my dad would do it. My dad would actually cook because she would she won't eat anything we cook. It was only what dad would cook. Oh wow. And then and that's, that's what beautiful. man is all about, that's you know, right. you know. 
優しくて力強い。私、シンボルは何だっけ力持ちで優しい、シンボル。And I think it's a great symbol to try to, try to do that, which is hard, you know. I look at that and I'm like, man, that, that's, that's, that's hard to do. And, and that's real true. It takes、that's、a real man to a take real man that. To that. And he stood up, he raised all of us. You look at all these kids, they all made it. No one went to jail, you know. Everybody got nice families, you know. And look at me, the stuff he taught、yeah. me is everything. Come to a whole nother, on the other side of the planet and make it to the top. Yeah, so, you know. He、I'm、had very, to be proud of that. I'm so grateful. I'm glad because that's what my motivation was. People、mm-hmm. ask me, what motivate you all the time? I tell them, all I have to do is think of my parents. There you go. I'm, I'm nothing compared to what they've done, you know. And because they're so religious and so spiritual, their prayers, I'm just answers to their prayers. I'm the one that had to go to do things because they were getting pissed off, but they're actually doing it because they love their family. And the answers that couldn't get to them, you know, they passed, but what they prayed, actually, I'm the messenger of what they prayed about. That's right, and, I, and, 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 right. and a result of, of their prayers. And I believe that very much. And so that's why I don't, you know, I, don't, I really don't sit on. The throne and try to take credit of nothing because they deserve everything, you know. And I'm glad I did everything in my strength and everything in my time to spend a lot of time with my parents, and everything I did was to make them happy, you know. And that's why I feel very comfortable even after two years of his passing. I feel the warmth because I know I did everything, and I, I feel real good even when he passed. I just I'm so happy now you get to celebrate your life up there with mom and everybody else that went before you, you know. so That's what life is all about. You got to be honest, man. You got to know who you want to actually、um, really、uh, cherish in your life and, and, and work towards that. You know, everything else is secondary to me. Yeah, for real, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless, man. I hope this isn't the last time. Oh, no, man. Call me anytime, man.、That's、Even you can double and triple book me and I'll be here. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm glad. You know, the good thing about double booking, we get to learn about each other. Don't you? Even more. No, no, it would be more interesting to have even three people sitting around. Three people sitting around here. And, then, and, and just turn we it into. We should just eat in here, have the food、yeah. delivered. Yeah, and, <laughs> and just make it a conversation because it's、That's、interesting.、True. We can do that. We all come from different worlds. And, and, and it's just, good to hear the other parts because、yeah. we, have, we cross over each other so much. That's what this whole podcast is about. Getting people to hear, but they do it individually. But you're yeah, right. Yeah. I'm going to start doing some group stuff. Yeah, because you think you, you, your, your edge is different. My edge is different. That's right. His edge is different. Is different John、time. is completely different. But we all kind of relate because we're trying to do what we do with regular doing in the U.S., which we couldn't. We had to adjust to, this, to the, the environment and the culture here to get where we're at because we couldn't do it the way we do. That's right. And we understand the culture here. That's why we're successful in what we do because. We've learned to work with it. That's right. Not to fight it. That's right. So, you know, <laughs> that's the great thing about this whole thing, which is grateful. You got to put it together. You, you're connected to our international world, our international business world here in Japan. So, I think it's a great thing just to have conversations with, have a three conversations, different you know, sports, gaino, and, you know, business, and, right, right. and all mix up all kinds of stuff, you know. Because this is what. People have to learn about more than I don't care about if you're famous or not, but that's right. real, life, real. Real, life, real life, this is real. Real life activities is something that people are dealing with today, and you know, the struggle is for real. The majority of people are struggling with this pandemic, and people are looking for answers. You know, even I, I, I'm pretty sure you guys had to go through some struggle, but had to find a solution. Everything is finding a solution to get out of it. I don't care how bad you are, how good you are, but if you sit and talk, my dad used to tell me every time you sit and wait, you just, you just like cold meat in a, in a ice box. <laughs> yeah, because、right. cold meat, you just sit there you and you freeze. There. Freeze, right. You know, if you stop moving, then that meat stops moving, man. Something's going to happen. And that's, and that's it. But even the struggle comes with the struggle, man. Everything else comes come with a great reward at the end of the day, man. <clears throat> Let me thank you. Love life. Let me thank all of you for watching this podcast. Remember to press like, subscribe, and remember it's all on loan. So continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed, as Konisky just told me.